Good afternoon. The first item of business today is portfolio questions, and we will start with question number one from Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the future of Cornton Vale Prison. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. <coughs> in 2015, I announced that Scotland would adopt a new approach to supporting women in custody. This approach includes plans for a new small national prison for women to be located on the current site of HMP and YOI Cornton Vale. On the 11th of July 2017, the demolition of Bruce House commenced, signalling the continued commitment to replace Cornton Vale with a small national facility for 80 women on the site. A separate assessment centre will also be included on the site to cater for up to 25 women. Initial preparatory work has already been completed, with further work continuing in 2018 and beyond. The first public consultation event was held as part of the proposal of application notice on the 6th of December 2017, and a second will be held on the 16th of January 2018. Following the conclusion of the planning process, it's anticipated that the procurement process to identify a contractor will conclude in August 2018, with construction commencing thereafter in winter 2018. Plans remain on track for the national facility to be operational by the end of 2020. Bruce Crawford. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that traditional prisons have not always achieved the outcomes for female prison offenders that we would want? And is it not now therefore crucial that we continue to look at alternative custodial arrangements such as the community-based custodial units he mentioned, and can this Cabinet Secretary at this time provide any details on the likely implications for future staffing at Cornton Vale? If he can't commit to that today, will he provide me with that information at the earliest possible juncture? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, yes, I do. Uh, that's why the proposal uh, is being taken forward uh, with Scotland's new female custodial estate, uh, which includes the design of two, the initial two community custodial units. The first of the CCUs will be located in Maryhill in Glasgow and at a site in Dundee. Uh, the purpose behind these units is to allow women to be held closer to their families uh, and provide them with the opportunity to engage with community-based services in those localities. The CCUs uh, will focus on helping women to develop uh, the strategies that can support them in successfully reintegrating back into the community and from moving away from a uh, lifestyle that involves offending. Uh, in relation to uh, staffing, uh, the approach that we are taking forward with the new uh, facilities, in particular the national facility, is still in the process of development and as such um, I'm not able at this stage uh, to determine the exact staffing profile uh, as the model uh, is being fully defined. But I would certainly, of course, uh, be happy to provide a member with more detailed information when that becomes available. But in the meantime, um, I can assure the member that the fullest consultation will take place, place with staff at Conton Vale and with their trade union representatives. Dean Lockhart. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. The Mental Welfare Commission recently visited Cornton Vale Prison. Their report highlighted concerns relating to the availability of mental health specialists, suitable medication, and also suggested an audit of prison officer training to improve mental health awareness. What assurances can the Cabinet Secretary give that the proposed restructuring of Cornton Vale Prison will not affect the mental welfare of those prisoners with complex mental health conditions? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, one of the purposes behind moving to the new model is to ensure that we have got better engagement with the community-based services, particularly for women who may have an underlying mental health issue within the locality with which they come from, so that when they leave the community custodial unit, they go back into the community that still has the services that have been supporting them while well they're within the uh, community custodial unit. And that's the purpose behind it, rather than having a single national facility that then, once the woman leaves that establishment, has to be established in another part of the country if they require mental health uh, services. Uh, the recommendations and the, the findings within the Mental Welfare Commission report are issues that are being considered by uh, the Scottish Prison Service in partnership with NHS Fort Farley, who are responsible for providing healthcare services within, uh, within our prison estate in Conton uh, Vale. But I can, give the, I can give the member assurance that issues relating to mental health and helping to support women in particular is one of the key factors behind the new model that we're moving to uh, in dealing with women who come into custody. Question number two, Elaine Smith. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether the Lord Advocate will provide an update regarding how the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Services reform of its working practices in dealing with sexual offence cases will help ensure that victims feel supported during the justice process. Lord Advocate, James Wilson. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, um, Presiding Officer. Sexual offences now make up 75% of the services High Court caseload and the number of cases of sexual crime reported to, to the service continues to increase. Uh, that means that uh, victims of crime are coming uh, forward uh, and that the, the Crown can, when the evidence is available, bring perpetrators uh, to justice. Sexual offence cases are dealt with by specialist prosecutors and the way that the work is undertaken is being reorganised in response to the increased caseload with a view to speeding up case preparation and to seeking to reduce the time which it takes to bring cases to trial. Since September 2017, the service's victim information advice staff working on High Court sexual offence cases have had specific geographic responsibility. This means that the complainers should now generally have a single individual who will be responsible provide, for providing her with information. All complainers in High Court sexual offence cases should be con contacted within 24 hours of the accused first appearing in court and the service has now introduced additional commitments to make further contact within a short period thereafter. In November, the Inspectorate of Prosecutions made 12 recommendations for further improving the way in which the service handles sexual offences. I accepted all of those recommendations, and work is in hand towards their implementation. Elaine Smith. Thank you, and can I thank the Lord Advocate for his response and welcome the commitment to make progress on the recommendations of the review, particularly since one area highlighted is that the most recent conviction rate for rape and attempted rape is 48% compared to 72% for all sexual crimes. Would the Lord Advocate agree that maintaining public confidence in the whole system for dealing with sexual offences is absolutely crucial? Could he outline the rationale for the decision not to take action against the two footballers, Goodwillie and Robertson, accused of rape by Denise Clare and subsequently found guilty of rape in a civil action? And will the decision by the Crown Office not to prosecute be re revisited in light of the successful civil action and the failure of the appeal against that in November? Um, Lord I, sorry, I entirely agree that uh, maintaining public confidence in the system of investigation and prosecution of crime is of the uh, highest importance. Um, uh, it would not be appropriate for me to um, uh, 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 discuss the um, details of any individual prosecutorial decision. Um, the approach that requires to be taken when considering a prosecution is different from the approach which applies in a civil case. The standard of proof is uh, for good reason, um, different. Uh, the prosecutor has to prove the case beyond reasonable doubt. And there are a series of evidential uh, rules which apply in criminal cases, but which don't apply uh, in uh, civil cases. Um, I can uh, say that the uh, Crown, um, uh, through the work of the specialist prosecutors who uh, undertake uh, high court sexual offences work, um, considers uh, carefully um, all, all cases of this sort and uh, decisions are made based on the uh, evidence that's available and a careful analysis and application of the law to that evidence. Question number three, Willie Reddy. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when fatal accident inquiries into the M9 crash and the death of Sheku Bayou will be held. Lord Advocate. Um, the separate investigations by the Crown into each of these two incidents uh, are continuing under the direction of, of a senior advocate deputy. Whilst considerable progress has been made, further work requires to be completed before a fully informed decision can be made uh, about potential criminal proceedings in each of these cases. Uh, that decision has to be taken before the timing of a fatal accident inquiry can be considered. Uh, officials continue to keep the families of the deceased advised and indeed meetings with those affected by the M9 incident took place as recently as December 2017. Willie Rennie. The Lord Advocate for his answer. It's been two and a half years since the, the death of Sheku Bayou, John Yule and Lamara Bell. That's two and a half years that the families and the police officers have been waiting for inquiry 
and for answers, and I am genuinely concerned for their welfare. Has the Lord Advocate made an assessment of the impact on the families and the police officers of this wait, and what can be done to speed up the process? Lord Advocate. Uh, I'm grateful to Willie Rennie for the question. I, I am ac acutely conscious of the impact that the passage of time has on all of those who are affected uh, by uh, these cases and indeed uh, any uh, case. Um, each of these cases involves a substantial investigation uh, which involves complex questions including both factual questions and legal questions. Uh, those involved um, would expect and are entitled to the investigation being undertaken with the utmost thoroughness and um, while recognizing the effect that the passage of time uh, uh, has for those concerned, um, uh, uh, my fundamental commitment in the public interest is to ensure that investigations of this sort are undertaken uh, thoroughly, fully, uh, and with a view to ensuring that the answers which will be produced at the end of the day are uh, soundly based. I can say, as I said in my uh, uh, previous answer, that the Crown is in contact with the families of the deceased uh, and keeps them uh, advised of the state of play. And indeed, as I said, in the M9 case, uh, there was a meeting with, the, uh, 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 with members of the family of the deceased uh, as recently as December. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Nicholas Randall was found dead in 2008, three years after he disappeared. Despite a whistleblower identifying multiple items of evidence which suggest his death was suspicious, the police ruled otherwise. So will the government ensure that Police Scotland properly explain this decision and in the name of transparency, release the case review report and any related documentation? I'm not sure that particular case directly relates to the question here, which is about two specific fatal accident inquiries. If the Lord Advocate wishes to add a comment, he may do, but Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The families and victims uh, and witnesses uh, have waited five years for the fatal accident inquiry into the Clutha helicopter tragedy, which begins this autumn. So what reassurances can the government give that we won't wait five years for the incidents that have been mentioned in, in this question? And, what, uh, and how frequently are the communications that he mentioned at being held with the families concerned with the M9 and uh, uh, Aboyu case? Lord Advocate. Yes. Uh, well, Mr. Johnson's absolutely uh, 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 right to note that in the Clutha case, we've passed an important milestone because a decision has been able to be taken uh, that on the evidence currently available, um, criminal proceedings are, are not anticipated. We can therefore proceed to a fatal accident inquiry. In, in the two uh, cases about which Mr. Rennie has asked me, um, the question of whether or not, and I've stress those words whether or not criminal proceedings uh, should be brought is one which still requires to be made. Uh, it requires to be made on the basis of the fullest and most thorough investigation um, of what are in each case um, uh, um, circumstances which raise complex questions both of fact and of law. Um, once that decision has been made, uh, then we will be able to move to, to the next stage um, of, of, of proceedings. Question for David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many calls the emergency services responded to over a festive period. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Strictly comparable figures for emergency call volume across police, fire and ambulance are not available. However, I can advise that between 7 a.m. on the 15th of December and 7 a.m. on the 3rd of January, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service received a total of 6,160 emergency calls. Police Scotland received a total of 27,876 calls via 999 between the 15th of December and the 2nd of January, as well as 83,146 calls to the emergency 101 non-emergency number. The Scottish Ambulance Service received a total of 73,049 calls in the same period. 
David Torrance. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Will the Cabinet Secretary join me in expressing sincere thanks to all emergency service staff who continue to work over the Christmas and New Year to keep us safe? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, President Officer, the festive period is always a very demanding time for our emergency services. However, due to the dedication and hard work of those who work in those services, they have again risen to meet the challenges presented by the Christmas and New Year period. I know I speak for all members when I say how much we value the enormous contribution that they make to keeping our people and community safe over the festive period and throughout the course of the year. Maurice Corrie. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I'd like to associate myself with the words of praise for those on the front line in our emergency control centres, the support staff and the volunteers who do such a great job. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell this chamber what he is going to do to support the staff in our emergency control centres by tackling the issue of hoax calls following the publication of figures that show that these calls have taken up 28,107 minutes, which is over 20 days of their time since 2012? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, we've taken forward a range of actions um, over an extended period of time now to tackle the issue of hoax calls to all of our emergency services, whether it be ambulance, fire or the police. I visited Bilston Glen just before Christmas uh, to meet with the uh, staff there and it continues to be a problem which they experience in not only just hoax calls but individuals calling 101 or even using the 999 uh, emergency number for inappropriate reasons as well. And part of the work that's been taken forward by Police Scotland and other emergency services to educate people and making sure that when they are utilising these emergency and non-emergency numbers that they are doing so appropriately. Uh, but alongside that, also tackling issues relating to hoax calls. Uh, I don't think there is any single solution uh, to the issue of hoax calls other than to continue to remind people about the potential impact, adverse impact it can have on the service in that resources are diverted away uh, to a hoax incident uh, when they are being deprived from what is a legitimate incident that they should be responding to. Question number five, June McAlpine. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding the European Arrest Warrant. Cabinet Secretary. European Arrest Warrant is a significant component of the extradition process. It is a part of the package of justice measures which work together to form the toolkit which supports collaboration on matters of internal security, law enforcement and criminal justice across the EU. These measures have proved vital to rapid information sharing and effective cooperation between the police and prosecutors across the EU. Yet we stand to lose these as a result of Brexit. And despite continued requests, to date, there has been no substantive discussion with the UK Government on European arrest warrants or any of the other measures which ensure the safety and security of our citizens. June McAlpine. I thank the Minister for that answer. Just this week, prosecutors were granted a European arrest warrant to help track the suspect of an armed robbery at the Glen Eagles Hotel uh, to Spain, illustrating the ongoing importance of the system. Sir Julian King, the UK's European Commissioner, who is responsible for security, has stated that the jurisprudence relating to the European arrest warrant is European Court of Justice jurisprudence. Does the Minister agree that it's high time that the UK Government dropped its foolish red line, preventing any future role for the European Court of Justice, and started to seriously negotiate with the EU27 to keep as many of the advantages of the European arrest warrant as possible? Cabinet Secretary. General Officer, the members raised uh, two uh, uh, important uh, separate but linked issues. The European Arrest Warrant is a vital tool to our uh, law enforcement agencies uh, to bring perpetrators of serious crime of the very nature uh, that the member made reference to in Glen Eagles to justice. Uh, the Justice and Home Affairs uh, cross-border measures include the European Arrest Warrant, uh, are EU-wide and fall under the jurisdiction of the European Court of the EU, which is the ultimate interpreter of EU law. Member states are required to give its judgments primacy. Uh, the UK Government's Security, Law Enforcement and Criminal Justice, a future partnership paper, uh, set out a proposal for a new security treaty to maintain continued security, law enforcement and criminal justice cooperation after Brexit. However, it reiterates the UK Government's position that any new model will not involve the UK being subject to the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice. Therefore, any new treaty will have to be underpinned by a new legal agreement 
on an alternative means of dispute resolution. The arrangements, are currently, the arrangements that we have currently in place are essential to ensuring security and safety of our people and save vital time and need to be maintained. Although we support uh, the aim of agreeing a deep and special relationship with the EU uh, to ensure the cooperation can be continued, we expect and we would expect, accept the Court of uh, Justice of the European Union jurisdiction on these matters uh, as a refusal to do so uh, would significantly damage any chance of retaining access to these important law enforcement and security measures. Thank you. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and the law officers and members? We'll move on now to questions on culture, tourism and external affairs. And we will start with question number one from Ash Denham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the Chamber may, may also wish to note at this point that I am the PLO to the culture portfolio. To ask the Scottish Government what support it is giving to creative industries and the arts. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, this Government recognises the value of the creative industries and the arts, and that is why the draft budget for 2018-19 includes an additional £6.6 .6 million to allow Creative Scotland to maintain the level of its regular funding programme, as well as doubling the investment for screen. As we begin the Year of Young People, we are also protecting the £9 million for the Youth Music Initiative and increasing funding for Systema Scotland. And we continue to support the creative industries and the arts by providing opportunities for collaboration and partnership, including the ongoing work with the Creative Industries Advisory Group, which I co-chair. Ashton. In light of the UK Government's failure to create a UK-wide lottery cuts handling plan, can the Cabinet Secretary outline what the Scottish Government's increase in funding will mean for the sector? Well, the serious concerns for the culture sector was the, the uh, projected reduction in lottery funding and clearly decisions by the UK Government in terms of deregulation and other matters relating to lottery has seen a reduced income. Uh, what we have managed to secure in the draft budget um, is funding to help mitigate that and the stability and the grant and aid, fun uh, and aid that we're also providing for Creative Scotland will mean that the final decisions that they're making about regular funded organisations in January uh, can be done with a much more positive outlook than initially expected. Uh, it's still a draft budget and uh, it, this will only be provided if the Parliament uh, votes for the budget. Rachel Hamilton. Deciding officer, to ask the Cabinet Secretary what work is being done by the Scottish Government to ensure the screen sector has the correct infrastructure to strengthen Scotland's film and TV sector. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the screen unit uh, blueprint was published uh, by Creative Scotland um, at the end of December. Uh, it was put together with all the agencies and clearly additional investment is important to take forward, not just the infrastructure, but the, the ability to, to, to invest in uh, film and uh, the TV sector. So two aspects to that. One is uh, funding, additional funding of 10 million pounds will double the available funding. That will make a big difference in relation to what's available, but also the opportunity to provide relationships, new relationships, for example, with the BBC, may also provide opportunities for uh, in ensuring that the investments available uh, more broadly for film and television can be maximized to grow the industry. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary may be aware of the growing culture gap there is between the poorest and riches within our society. Recent figures from the Household Survey show there's now a 22-point gap when it comes to participating in cultural activity, which is a 2% increase on 2015. While the investment mentioned by the Cabinet Secretary is welcome, how will it specifically target inclusiveness and focus on closing this gap for all generations? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as the member may be aware, one of the most powerful uh, research evidence that we have is that young people who participate in uh, music activity or indeed wider arts activity when they're younger are more likely to be audiences in the future, regardless of parental income. So our activity in providing funding for the Youth Music Initiative and sustaining that in the, in the face of a Conservative uh, UK government austerity uh, is a very important part of that. The expansion for Systema Scotland, £2.5 million of investment is very 
benefiting particularly targeted uh, young people in a number of our cities. Also our free um, access for our uh, collections, for our museums, our galleries. And as part of my letters of guidance to all our organisations, I make it clear that in, uh, in tackling some of the inclusion issues, or tackling the opportunities for young people in areas of deprivation is very, very important. So I place a particular um, importance in that area and everything we're doing allows us to contribute to that. But protecting the culture budget uh, is going to be a very important part of making sure that we can close that gap. Question number two, Richard Lockhead. Can I ask the Scottish Government for its plans for the historic Dallas Dew distillery? Secretary. As a property in the care of the Scottish Ministers, conservation and management of the Dallas Dew distillery is handled by Historic Environment Scotland under a scheme of delegation. I had meetings with uh, Richard Lockhead in Historic Scotland previously about bringing this distillery back into action. Uh, the member had previously raised with me the potential to bring the distillery into activity back in 2015. The distillery is in the ownership of Diageo, but Diageo agreed a guardianship arrangement in 1998 with Historic Scotland. As there are commercial sensitivities to this issue, Richard Lockhead will be aware there are limits to what can be discussed. Richard Lockhead. As the Cabinet Secretary has noted for a number of years, I've been pushing for new ideas to develop the fantastic potential that this historic distillery has for the local economy and for tourism and to bring other benefits uh, as well. In recent months, a number of individuals and organisations have brought to me a number of creative and exciting ideas which could make a real difference to the distillery and bring new investment. So would the Cabinet Secretary be willing to speak to Historic Environment Scotland who have shared those ideas with to push things forward so that this year, 2018, we can open a new chapter in the fantastic story of this historic distillery to bring these massive benefits to local community, tourism and the economy? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I, I'd like to recognise the work of Richard Lockhead as the constituency MSP in driving forward uh, this new and creative idea. Uh, there are limits to what I can say publicly, but I do take an interest in uh, the, the initiative. I think there's a real initiative to bring different parties together to make this happen. Uh, it is quite complex in terms of uh, balancing some of the, the issues, uh, but I will, uh, uh, I will agree to speak to Historic Environment Scotland to ascertain the latest progress and what can we uh, do to help facilitate what I think is a very uh, innovative way to make sure that our heritage um, can be demonstrated, not just, I suppose, in some of our, our wider cultural areas, but also in some of our industrial heritage, of which whisky is most certainly part. Question number three, Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the publication of its new strategy for engagement with China. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the refresh of Scotland's China engagement strategy is currently under development. We expect to publish the revised strategy in spring 2018. Mary Fee. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? The benefits for the Scottish-China engagement strategy are clearly positive. However, this is only known to the niche groups that are involved in the specifics of the strategy, either through small business, educational institutes, local government or the close-knit Scottish-Chinese community. What work is the Scottish Government doing to encourage links between local Scottish community groups and Chinese groups to promote the strategy and the Chinese culture and to ensure wider society can maximise the benefits of the Scottish-Chinese engagement strategy. And finally, presiding officer, with the new strategy to be published in spring 2018, can I extend an invitation to the Cabinet Secretary to come along to the cross-party group in China to discuss the strategy with yeah. its members? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I thank the member. I have indeed attended the cross-party group uh, previously. Uh, I do think uh, I, do, I, do, I do think the, the importance of the people-to-people uh, -people, uh, engagement is, is, is vital. Interestingly, uh, the China to, to the China people-to-people -people, um, uh, engagement that took place recently, uh, the cultural focus was here in Scotland. Uh, a lot of that is institutional, and so there, we are facilitating the institutional relationships. I think the member touches on some of the wider aspects of community to community, and I think the Confucius Institutes, which are now very extensive, have got far more, I think, per head um, in Scotland than, than elsewhere in the UK. I think that is a very good way to, to, to engage because it's about the culture, not just the language. So I do think that's the, the benefit there. Also, um, we've now got 18 out of 19 of Scots Higher Education Institutes have academic and research uh, links. Now, you may say, well, that's institutional, it's not community to community, but I think we can use those and the uh, local authority relationships to build more of a people to people uh, relationship, relationship and dialogue. Um, so I agree to that and uh, diary permitting, I would be happy to attend the cross party group. Uh, Stuart McMillan. 
Thank you, President Officer. Um, uh, Cabinet Secretary, I'm aware of two businesses uh, involved in the Scottish culture and music who are keen to export their goods and services into China. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide any information to assist their efforts, please? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, clearly, in relation to SMEs uh, exporting and uh, helping uh, raise international ambitions and also supporting uh, people overcome some of the barriers they might have in international exporting is something that, uh, that we're very keen to support. SDI are working to, to tackle some of these issues in particular. Um, and if the member gives me details of, of their particular interests, I can make sure that SDI makes some kind of contact to provide the relevant advice. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the UK Government's Department for Transport has negotiated increases in the number of passenger flights between UK airports and China, has the Cabinet Secretary met with representatives from Scottish airports to help them bid and prepare for the increased number of tourists from China? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I have had a number of meetings uh, discussing the opportunities for Chinese tourists, both with the, the industry itself. Uh, I have personally uh, been uh, on delegations when the issues of direct flights have been raised uh, in, in, in visits to, to, to China with the, the Chinese government, and also our transport uh, minister is active involved in this area. So I know every is very uh, you know, anxious, and there is a great deal of anticipation to the opportunities that can be provided. I can't at this stage give you uh, any, any particular particular detail or announcements, but I can say our airports and uh, government are very actively involved in this area. Question number four, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the potential withdrawal of funding by Aberdeen City Council to the Aberdeen International Youth Festival. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I understand that Aberdeen City Council's Urgent Business Committee met on the 21st of December and made a final decision not to provide funding for the Aberdeen International Youth Festival. Uh, this outcome is in incredibly disappointing, but it hopefully provides an opportunity for the organisers to pursue other options and find a new way forward for the, uh, way forward for the festival in 2018, uh, Scotland's Year of Young People. My officials stand ready to offer advice on alternative sources of funding and help facilitate networking or new connections to support the festival if appropriate. Julian Martin. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and of course acknowledges that um, it's now uh, a matter of fact that by a narrow majority of Aberdeen City councillors, uh, former Labour councillors and Conservative councillors in the Finance Committee have indeed voted to withdraw funding from the festival. Um, can the Cabinet Secretary give any indication to the organisers of the festival and the disappointed young people and community organisations in the area who have benefited hugely from the festival's activities. That even if certain individuals in Aberdeen City Townhouse don't recognise the huge negative implications of their decision that the Scottish Government and other cultural agencies do, and can she commit to holding conversations with the organisers of the festival to give them assistance and advice that will allow them to find a way forward for the good of the young people of the North East and our local economy? Uh, as I said in my original answer, that my officials and uh, the Scottish Government agencies stand ready to offer advice on positive, uh, possible alternative sources of funding to help um, the Aberdeen International Youth Festival should the organisers make such an approach. Um, the impacts of the, and benefits of the festival, I think, are very well known uh, throughout the North East. Uh, we should, however, acknowledge that Aberdeen City Council has established a £100,000 cultural award programme for 2018-19. We've yet to see the full details, but hopefully that will give an opportunity for youth-led cultural projects and events in Aberdeen to take place to celebrate the Year of Young People in 2018. And I think it's, it's incumbent on all of us, uh, particularly in this year, whether it's a local level or national level, to make sure that we can uh, provide opportunities for young people to participate in arts in Aberdeen during the Year of Young People. Tom Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As you well know, I'm the Aberdeen City Council and I was a party to the decision to withdraw the funding from the Aberdeen Youth Festival. The festival has experienced declining uh, audiences and a lack of city participation over recent years. And in, including lackluster management and uh, governance structure, which left much to be desired. What is more disappointing for me, because I was very supportive of the general principles of the art festival, was the forward strategic plan was very inadequate to address the matters which, which should concern them. Does the, does the cabinet minister agree with me that it would be inappropriate to have awarded the funding to the, to the youth festival at this stage and look forward to an alternative business plan being presented by the 
Youth Festival, possibly funding from the City Council on an ad hoc basis. Cabinet Secretary. I think it's un inappropriate for, for any member to uh, attack the, the management of local volunteers and those involved in trying delivering festivals in our, our country. Um, the member may or may not still be a councillor. I'm, I'm not familiar if he's, if he's resigned or not. But this is the National Parliament of Scotland. Our job is to create the conditions, provide the strategic leadership, and to make sure there's funding in our organisations to, to drive forward um, these, these issues. But we have to respect there are many people, many volunteers that are involved in our festivals, and providing a bit of leadership and support to them is important. I don't know the details of the papers that went to the council, because this is not a council chamber, this is a parliament. But I want, I, I really think it's important that we support people who support our local festivals and I hope in whatever way forward uh, the, the, the council and the local um, the local volunteers can take forward this festival they do so in a positive and constructive way and don't use this chamber to attack management and volunteers of local organizations question number five Finley Carson to ask the Scottish government what it is doing to promote Galloway's natural features to attract tourists in our programme for government, we committed to promoting the south of Scotland, including Galloway, as a destination for coastal and forest tourism activities. This will continue our work with partners in developing Galloway's existing tourism assets, including its heritage, culture, creative arts, wildlife, nature and green tourism and local food and drink, and to build on the success of the Galloway Dark Sky Park and the south-west Scotland biosphere. To enhance Visit Scotland's existing work in the area, the Scottish Government's draft budget proposes an extra half a million pounds in uh, 2018-19 for additional marketing support specifically for the south of Scotland and this will help highlight those natural features that make Galloway a hidden gem amongst Scotland's many world-class attractions. The draft budget also proposes a further half a million pound for capital investment in forest tourism across the south of Scotland including trail development and signage. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response and I certainly agree that Galloway is a hidden gem. I also welcome the airing of the new BBC documentary Forest the forest based in the Galloway Forest is raising awareness of all aspects of life in and around the UK's largest forest park, recognising the fantastic work of District Forest, forest Manager uh, Cousin Hozak and his team. As well as producing over 600,000 tonnes of timber, the Galloway Forest contributes much to the environmental, cultural, tourism, tourism and recreational offering uh, that the Kingdom of Galloway has to offer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that this programme highlights and strengthens the argument in support of a Galloway National Park. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I uh, held a forest tourism summit recently precisely to look at the advantages of forest tourism in particular. I also had the opportunity to watch uh, the forest uh, that started this week. I was particularly impressed with the singing, but actually the education about the, the work um, and the importance uh, economically and also to tourists I think was well evident in the first episode, I look forward to, to seeing uh, others as well. I know in, in relation to uh, the National Parks, that's a responsibility um, of another Cabinet Secretary, but uh, I do, I do recognise uh, the opportunities that we have with the biosphere, with all the different uh, areas that we have in Galloway uh, to make sure that our natural environment can be key to what we're doing. But I can't give you a commitment on the National Parks. I understand there are tensions and issues there, not least on cost, but I appreciate the sentiment that he's putting forward. Emma Harper. Thank you. Um, I too agree that Bonnie Galloway is a hidden gem. Does uh, the Cabinet Secretary agree that biospheres provide a sustainable model which encourages tourism and allows local communities use of and access to land while preserving important natural ecosystems? Cabinet Secretary. I, I do. Scotland has two UNESCO biospheres and the other one is on Wester Ross and they, they're involved particularly in uh, programmes uh, funded by the EU and uh, with Greenland, Canada and Europe. Um, I think the initiatives that we can take uh, forward in collaboration internationally to learn from the best is really, really important. And the sustainable model of tourism is something that, as the Cabinet Secretary for Tourism, I'm delighted to take forward. Question six, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the reason was for the recent closures of tourist information centres across the South Scotland region and what alternative arrangements it is considering putting in place. Cabinet Secretary. 
the deployment of Visit Scotland's resources is an operational issue for the organisation and its board, although we maintain regular contact on a wide range of matter matters. Visit Scotland's new two-year strategy announced last October was developed following a 58% reduction in football, uh, footfall to uh, information centres across Scotland in the past decade. It will provide greater choice by offering digital products and access to local knowledge through industry partners, as well as 26 eye centres in its busiest locations. Visit Scotland has already established 1,604 uh, new local partnerships right across the country, with 256 local partnerships uh, signed up across the Scottish borders from Fries and Galloway in the Ayrshires. And these partnerships will ensure that information provision is available and in innovative and adaptable formats that we know that visitors are looking for. Claudia Beamish. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and I recognise the issue around the 58% drop in footfall at the eye centres um, in spite of the fact that um, the, of the positive information I received in, my, in the reply from uh, uh, Visit Scotland to my letter highlighting this issue about the fact that of course tourism has, has risen in itself. Um, I do have a concern which I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary can highlight. Well I appreciate um, the, it is an operational issue in relation uh, to these matters. Uh, it does link very closely with the issue of um, access to IT if we are going to move into the digital age with tourism uh, and, and that will complement the, the VIP Tourist Information Partnership Programme. Uh, the Galloway Forest, which was raised in the last question, is, a, is an example of this because I know that there is poor access to broadband and, IT, and to um, mobile in, in that area and I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary can comment on how this will, will move forward in terms of tourism if, if people can't access their apps or, or, uh, or the websites. Well, it's precisely why the Scottish Government has ensured that despite the very limited uh, broadband uh, rollout by the UK Government, that Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband uh, has ensured that instead of just 26 uh, premises in the Fries and Gallery, 85% of premises in Dumfries and Galloway um, have access uh, to speeds of 24 megabytes uh, and above uh, per second. So, you know, yes, that's a challenge, but we also know from the investment of the South plot for R100 will mean with the investment that we have, not just premises, but also access outdoor, both for mobile, but also for fibre broadband, will make sure that Scotland, and rural Scotland in particular, is one of the best areas to have access, which I think makes the point that it has to be joined up and coordinated, and I'm making sure that the tourism officials and the visit Scotland are keeping coordinated with the, the broadband rollout to ensure that that availability is there for tourists when they visit. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and all members for participation? That's the end of topical questions. We'll next hear from the uh, Cabinet Secretary for Justice, 